Well, good Tuesday morning, my friends. We have uh, found ourselves here again. I want to share a story this morning. Many of you know that uh, the clergy is my second career. Um, I used to work in, of all things, the insurance industry. I know, hard to believe that I might have been that guy trying to sell you insurance, right? Save the comments. But I, I do remember having a client when I worked in that world. And this is a guy who had built an extremely successful business for himself. He had a seven figure income. In fact, he owned an airplane to make it easier for him to travel all over the, the states and the countries. He knew all the movers and shakers in his industry. And this is a guy who was really at the, the top of his game. When I announced that I was leaving that world to do this, well, most of my colleagues and clients were quite shocked, but uh, he was particularly intrigued. He actually got in that airplane and flew to Las Vegas to visit me, ostensibly to thank me for the years that we had worked together. Now, I say ostensibly because the conversation really turned out to be less about that and more about how it was that I had come to this life-changing decision. He was shocked, but also fascinated, as he too was feeling a calling to do more, and yet something kept getting in the way. Now, he was about to sell this company and would soon have more money than any of us could ever spend in a lifetime. And this was going to free him to do really anything he liked. He felt called to finding ways to help others. And yet, when it came down to it, he chose to stay at the company and keep on running it for the new owners. Now, he certainly didn't need the money. And yet, he chose to keep running after the same things that he had always chased. They had, uh, to put it in the parlance of uh, Vito Corleone, made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. Or more precisely, an offer that he simply found it easier not to refuse. There's a, there's a collect in the church. You know, in our, our lessons, our, each one of our Sunday services, we begin with a collect, which is a special prayer to help us collect our thoughts and prepare ourselves for worship. This particular collect is one of my favorites, and a phrase from it is this, grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may, be beco may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. I just love that phrase, running to obtain your promises. We all, don't we? lead busy lives and sometimes feel that we are indeed running a race. We fill our lives with meetings, appointments, committees, to-do lists, etc. And as we run, we don't often stop to reflect on the effects of what we're doing. Jesus doesn't want that. Uh, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's, it's a reminder to slow down, to think about what we're doing and be sure that we're doing things for the right reason. You see, my client, my friend, he was indeed running, but what he was chasing was not fulfilling him and not helping to build up God's kingdom. And yet, if we're honest, many of us find ourselves running that very same race. I'm not going to read you the gospel story of the rich man and Lazarus because you all know it pretty well. Uh, but some comments for you. Now, at first, it's, it's very interesting that Lazarus is given a name, but not the rich man. Jesus, I think, wants us to see ourselves in the parables. And so by giving Lazarus a name, he assures that we will associate ourselves not with Lazarus, but with the rich man. For however much we have or don't have, I think each of us can identify with the rich man. Have you ever had one of those meals? I mean, the ones you remember for the rest of your life. 
the one where the table is beautifully set. The food is prepared by some of the world's best chefs. There's a wine paired with each course. Oh, I have had one. Actually, I've been blessed. I've had a few of those, and they are treasured memories. But the rich man in the parable, well, for him, that was Tuesday night. He dined that way every night. He dressed in the finest of purple linens, and he had everything going for him. Not so, not so for Lazarus, who lay in the dust at the rich man's gate, hoping for some charity. You see, at the time, napkins didn't really exist, so after each meal, the diners would wipe their hands on bread, which was then thrown outside the gate. And it was this bread that Lazarus hoped to get if he could manage the strength to wrestle it away from the dogs who competed with him for it. Yeah, think of that imagery. Kind of difficult. Both men die, and now the tables are turned. Lazarus goes to heaven to be with Abraham, and the rich man goes to Hades, where he's eternally punished. Now, it's interesting to note that it is Abraham and not God who is the heavenly being in the story. I suspect Jesus wanted to be sure his audience knew that these were not Gentiles. No, these were good Jews. It was another way to be certain his listeners would put themselves into the story. The rich man begs Father Abraham to send Lazarus to serve him. Think about this. Even in hell, it seems that the rich man still feels entitled. <laughs> but from this, we learn another crucial fact. The rich man knew Lazarus. Lazarus was not just some nameless, faceless beggar at the gate. No, no, no. The rich man knew who he was and that he was a fellow Jew. To have treated him with such disregard was a serious violation of the Jewish custom of zedaka, what we would call charity. But it's far more than that, for charity means giving out of benevolence. Well, zedaka is really an act of justice and righteousness. For the rich man to have knowingly avoided this responsibility would surely have been shocking to the listeners, and they now had no doubt why he wound up in Hades. The rich man went to Hades not because he was rich, but because he was selfish. He saw the world in a way that made it totally fine with him that he was feasting each night while Lazarus was lying weak from hunger in the dust at his gate. He simply saw this as the way the world worked, and that was his sin. Like many of us, the rich man had been running in the world, but he was running after the wrong things. He was chasing wealth and his own pleasure, but he was unable to see that that is a false pursuit. I'm reminded of a line from the song by the Eagles, Desperado. The line says, it seems to me some fine things have been laid upon your table, but you only want the ones you can't get. That, that was the issue for the rich man and my friend in the insurance business had the very same problem. He wanted to do the right thing, but time and again found that it was easier to run after the next deal, after the next sale, after the next thing that the world says that we're supposed to value. Make no mistake, friends, being countercultural is hard. But that is precisely what Jesus calls us to be. In a letter to Timothy, Paul says, Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them instead to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever manage to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. It was too late for the rich man, but it wasn't too late for his brothers. And my friends, it's not too late for each one of us. So here's a question for you to ponder as we finish up. 
What is it that you are running toward?